Well done. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. That was amazing. Thank you, kids. That was, that was awesome. Thank you to our ukulele players. I believe one of them was the very first time that even touched the thing. So praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Yeah, I, look, um, I wasn't expecting that part of that story, but that was great, Anita. Thank you. I want to talk today about what I believe is the next best thing to Christmas, okay? Now, when I say the next best thing to Christmas, I'm not talking about the gift giving of Christmas. I'm not talking about the food you have. I'm not talking about the family time that you have. I'm talking about all things Christ, okay? So the birth of Christ is no more important than the crucifixion of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. Everything to do with Christ was a significant major event that happened that brings joy to us. But apart from all of that, I believe that there is something that is the next best thing to Christmas. And we actually pick it up in the story of Christ, what becomes important. If Christ had just been born as a babe and left to his own devices, what would he have become? But Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the babe that was born, was entrusted to an earthly family. He was entrusted to a mother and father. And I want to say today that the next best thing to Christmas is a family, is a family that loves you, is a mother and father that loves you. And look, Anita had no idea what I was talking going to talk about when I said I was talking about Moses, but I want to talk about Moses' parents. I want you to come to Exodus chapter 1 and Exodus chapter 2. Moses would not have been able to have done what he had done if, first of all, he did not have parents that loved him. And I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but when Moses was born, he was born in one of the most difficult times in the lives of the children of Israel. Moses should have been killed immediately upon birth. Pharaoh was doing everything that he could. Times had radically changed for the people of Israel. While Joseph was alive, the Pharaoh was gracious to the Israelites, gave them the pick of the land, allowed them to be very prosperous and have had everything. And they were blessed while Joseph was there. Because while Joseph was there, Egypt was blessed. Egypt was cared for by the God of heaven. They had everything that was needed. But then the day came when Joseph got old. Joseph died along with the Pharaoh. And when Moses is born, there's a Pharaoh on the throne that is thinking very different. He's become to hate the Israelites. He becomes fearful of the Israelites. And he becomes so fearful of them that he endeavors to work them to death. He makes all sorts of regulations that enforces them into complete slavery. Denies them the privileges of being who they were. And so when you look in Exodus chapter 1 verse 11 it says, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh supply cities and so on and so on. Wow, it wasn't a good time to be alive, but it didn't work. The best that Pharaoh could do could not quiet the Israelites, could not bring them to, into submission. 
God was still blessing these people even though they were in adversity. And so when you come across to verse 15, he gets very radical, the Pharaoh. And there were people called midwives, right? We still have midwives today. When children are being born, they are entrusted to the care of a midwife. And that midwife is there to help that child to come into life. And these midwives were instructed that when a boy was born, they were to kill it. Wow. Fortunately, the midwives didn't like that idea. And so, and so they didn't go through with the plan. And when Pharaoh wanted to know why there were still boys running around, the midwives told a lie. Oh, the, the Israelites, they're too healthy, they're too quick for us, they're too slick. They deliver them just like that, and before we get there, the baby's born. Pharaoh said, okay, I'll take care of that. And when we come to verse 22, the Pharaoh is now so hostile with these people that he sends a decree out. Every son who was born shall, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Wow, this is when Amram and Jochebed are having a son. Could you imagine being them? Could you imagine what's going through their mind? Yes, they've got Miriam, they've got older children, but here Moses is born and he is a boy. Wow, just imagine what was going through their mind. And so Amram and Jochebed, they trust in God. As parents, they want this son looked after. And they do what is necessary for that son. It is believed that they, like all other people at this time, all other Israelites at this time, would have made a little cavity, a little space under the floor of their house. And there they would have laid baby until, of course, the baby got too old and the cry would be too loud and it became unsafe. And so at about three months of age, Jochebed, how can I protect my son that God has given me? What can I do for my son? Wow. Wow. I don't know, parents, if you've ever had that anguish, that moment in time where you, what do I do? What do I do? And so, through the wisdom of God and the blessings of God, that little boat, that little vessel of salvation was made. And little Moses was put in that vessel and taken down by the river. And so we're told, in, in Exodus chapter 2, the story of Moses. And it says in verse 1, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank, and his sister stood afar off to know what would be done. Wow. Could you imagine doing that? Could you love your child that much that that is what you would do? And fortunately, you know the story, you've seen the children do it well this morning, that the princess came and the princess found the baby and the princess was drawn to the baby. We're told that she had compassion for that child. Wow, compassion for an Israelite? That's foreign stuff. But this woman had compassion for that child. And Miriam goes up to her. What courage that sister had. 
Hey, this is a family working together. This is a family in harmony with each other, and they're working for the well-being of that boy child. And as, as Miriam approaches the princess, she says, would you like me to find a nurse? Immediately she goes to Jochebed and has Jochebed come to receive back her own son, knowing full well that it was only for a short season. Parents, you've only got your children for a short season. Jochebed was only going to have Moses for a maximum of 12 years. And at the age of 12, he was surrendered to the household of Pharaoh to be nurtured in the ways of Egypt. But I want to say to you that it was those 12 years of being in the household of Amram and Jochebed that made Moses who he was. It wasn't the 20 years, 25 years in the palace. It was those 12 years in the household of his mum and dad that Moses was grounded in the things of God. And that's what sustained him. I want you now to come over to the life of Jesus and look at a very similar pattern. Very similar pattern that happens in the life of Jesus. Yes, we celebrate Christmas, but do we celebrate families? Do we celebrate mums, the love of a mum and dad? Do we celebrate the love of our children? Do we do that? Because when we come to the story of Jesus and we pick this up in Matthew chapter 2, you know that Jesus was born in the manger, right? The shepherds come and all of that stuff happens. The wise man comes. But who comes next? Who comes after the wise men? It's the king. It's the soldiers. It's the Roman army come next. Because they have, remember when the wise men came? They sought out the king and they asked, where is the king of Israel? Where's this boy that's going to be the king? And the Herod was alerted to the fact that Jesus was born. And so he becomes riled up and he puts out a death decree upon all boys. Not just Jesus, all boys. But fortunately the angel of the Lord is busy and fortunately the mother and father of, 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 Moses, of Jesus were prepared to listen to the angel of the Lord. And even the wise men were prepared to listen to the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said to the wise men, please don't go back there. Go home another way. And the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, hey, you've got to look after this child, Joseph. And if you go back a little bit earlier on to where the angel is talking to Mary, you find out that they know who this child is. That this child is the child of God sent from heaven and that he was being entrusted to the love and care of his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. And so it is when we come to verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you the word for Herod. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And like every good parent, Joseph says, not a problem. Not a problem. I want to ask you parents and families, is there anything ever too hard for you? that you could not do. Here, Joseph is being asked to take this child, to take it to Egypt. 
That's a different country, folks. That's a different place. It had been a hostile place for the Israelites for, for many hundreds of years. But, but it's the safe place. Oh, parents, families, you've got to keep your children in the safe place. You've got to take them to where it's safe. You've got to lead them to where it's safe. And here Joseph takes Jesus to Egypt. Wow. By the way, he didn't do it in a Mercedes Benz, okay? He did it in a very basic, basic format, a four-legged creature. And so Jesus is in Egypt. For two years, he's in Egypt. And then the time comes when he gets the message, okay, you can come home. You can come home. After the death of Herod, he is allowed to return. That's verse 19. After the death of Herod, a dream, and Joseph comes and takes this child back. Look at verse 21. Then he arose, took the young child and the mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of Father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Whoops. Ooh. The human element is starting to play a little part in the upbringing of Jesus. Yes. Joseph starts to have a little bit of fear. But notice, it was a good thing in this case. And, he, and, it told us, and we're told that being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken. So here, at the age of two, Jesus with his parents, his earthly parents, take up residence in Nazareth. And there he grows for the next ten years. And then at the age of 12, at the age of 12, because he had not yet died on a cross, because he had not yet become the Passover lamb, Jesus, along with his parents, follow the cultural practice of the Israelite people. And at the age of 12, he goes to attend Passover. And so we have where Joseph and Mary now take this child to, to practice, to be awakened to the things of God, to the knowledge of God, to the, to the teachers of the things of God. And so Jesus is here being taught these things, being taught these things. And so we find that Joseph and Mary have a very important part to play as they introduce Jesus into the practice of worship, practice of, of the, the service of the sanctuary and the service of the Passover. And they do this. And I want you to come to Luke chapter 2. I want you to come over to Luke chapter 2 and notice what happens here. Luke chapter 2 and we'll look at verse 39. Luke 2 verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city Nazareth and the child grew and came strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So here now, this is when they make the second journey to Nazareth. Their first journey was from Egypt. This journey is from Jerusalem back to Nazareth. And so now they take Jesus at the age of 12 but this is where the interesting thing takes part. Jesus, according to the customs and the culture of the time, 
should have actually been left in Jerusalem to become part of the, one of the rabbinic schools, to, to have a select rabbi become his instructor for the rest of life until he grows up. But no, he doesn't go down that pathway. Instead, he stays with Mary and Joseph. He stays in their home and he is taught in Nazareth the very important principles of life. He's taught in two, two, two fields, if you like. He is taught to work with his hands. Jesus was taught to have a trade, folks. Jesus was taught to have something behind him. And Jesus was taught as a carpenter. And upon the passing of Joseph, which was before Jesus was baptized, it was Jesus in the carpenter's shop who, who earned the living to support his mum and his family. So Jesus learned a trade well. He learned it exceptionally and was gifted at it. But he was also taught now in the things of God. If you have not read it before, in the book Desire of Ages, there is actually three chapters that talk about the early life of Christ. As, as, as the time he is born, as a child. If you haven't read it, folks, can I encourage you over the next week when you have your family worship that you read this section with your, yourselves and with your children. You will get some exceptional lesson, valuable lessons out of it as to how to be a family how to put God first, how to, to grow our children. And with that, if you read the chapter in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, um, about page 241, I think it is, is the chapter that talks about Moses' childhood. There's some parts here I'd, I would love to read to you. And I'll, I'll read a little bit. The mother, this is about Moses. The mother succeeded in concealing the child for three months. Then finding that she could no longer keep him safely, she prepared a little ark of rushes, making it watertight by means of slime and pitch. And so on. Miriam lingered near, apparently indifferent, but anxiously watching to see what would become of her little brother. And there were other watchers. Not people. No, heavenly watchers. I want to tell you, folks, I want to tell you, people of God, that God has sent his servants to be with you. This is not a journey we travel on our own. God is with us as we raise our families and nurture the next generation. Miriam had been secretly noting every movement. Perceiving that the child was tenderly regarded, she ventured near and at last said, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse? Oh, look, trust your children. Miriam, this, this young girl, was sensitive to what was going on. Oh, parents, guardians of children. Have you taught your children to be sensitive to what is going on? To sensitive to the way that God works? Sensitive to the way that the devil works? Be able to discern between the two and know that this is the moment. Yes, Miriam knew it was the moment to step forward and to approach the princess. And God gave her the wisdom to work through. God had heard the mother's prayers. Oh, it doesn't start with teaching, folks. It starts with praying. It starts with praying. Jochebed had prayed that God would be there that God 
would be the master of the situation. God heard the prayers of the mother. Her faith had been rewarded. It was with deep gratitude that she entered upon her now safe and happy task. She faithfully improved her opportunity to educate her child for God. For God. Yeah, that's to be an important element, isn't it? That we are training and teaching and educating a child for God. She faithfully improved her... Oh, sorry, I read that. She felt confident that he had been preserved for some great work and she knew that he must soon be given up to his royal mother to be surrounded with influences that would tend to lead him away from God. Isn't that the exact setting that we find ourselves in today? We are surrounded by influences that can take not only our children, but can take ourselves away from God. Yeah, we're surrounded by those influences. And <clears throat> Jochebed and Amram were well aware of what the household of Pharaoh was like and capable of. They knew full well what they were going to do to his son, to their son. But they made sure that he had enough information and had enough knowledge of the things of God that when the day came, he could make a wise decision. A wise decision. And that's a part. And, and so I would encourage you to read that. In the book, Desire Ages, as you step into these things of Christ, listen to this, page 82. Jesus did not ignore his relation to his earthly parents. Jesus valued it immensely to have a mother and a father looking after him on this earth, having family, from Jerusalem, he returned home with them and aided them in their life of toil. Wow. Parents, have you got your children doing things? <laughs> Keeping them busy? Idle hands? Whew, you know the rest. He hid in his own heart the mystery of his mission, waiting submissively for the appointed time for him to enter upon his work. That's, that's something that's lacking in community and society today. The willingness to be submissive. Okay? A lot of children don't like mum and dad being mum and dad. At a very quick age, they seize the moment to be the parent, to be the one making the decisions. We want to get out of that submissive attitude as quick as we can and become the adult. How sad it is that that's to the detriment of most. There is a time when children are able to have that discernment and make those wise decisions, but there is a period of time where it's not wise for them to be doing that. For 18 years, after he had recognized that he was the son of God, he acknowledged the tie that bound him to the home at Nazareth and performed the duties of a son, a brother, a friend, and a citizen. It's in this context that Ellen White says this very well-known saying, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in the contemplation of Christ. It's in the raising of Christ it's in the education of this boy, Jesus, that she makes this beautiful statement. Yes, he was being taught to be a carpenter, but he was also being taught to comprehend the things of God and all, of script, all that Scripture said about God and all that Scripture said about himself. He spent time in that contemplation. 
And we are encouraged today to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. I could read much more. Three amazing and beautiful, beautiful chapters. I want you to come to Luke 1. Because as it's talking about, as this passage is relating to Mary, the great duty and task that she would have of, of caring for Jesus and everything else, there is this amazing phrase given to her. I want you to come to Luke 1 verse 37. For with God, nothing is impossible. That were, those words were shared with Mary and Joseph as they were entrusted with the upbringing of Christ. They would be able to do it. They would be victorious in doing it because they were told that nothing is impossible to God. Wow, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that God had this, this compassion upon them? And he has that with every one of us as well. I want you to briefly come to, to John because there's something happens. As Jesus gets older, as Jesus gets to that point of 30, and you come into John chapter 2, something happens. And I love this. And this is what we need families, parents, this is what we need to do ourselves as our children get older and capable of caring for themselves. This is what we need to do like Mary. Look at this verse. This is the wedding at Cana. And, and you know the situation. It's a wedding. It's a happy time. But they've won, run out of the happy stuff. They've run out of the juice. They've run out of the wine. And you can't have a dry wedding. You've got to have some liquid refreshments at a wedding. But it's dried up. And Mary and Jesus have a bit of conversation about this. And after Mary has had the conversation with this, she goes to the people that she knows Jesus is going to come to. And look at what she says to them in verse 5. I love this verse. It's a beautiful verse. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says, you do it. Oh, Mary has surrendered. Mary has surrendered her authority over this child because he's not a child anymore. He's growing up. He's mature. And so she has, because of her training, she has every confidence in Jesus to know that he's going to do the right thing. Well, I wish we could say that of all of our children as we raise them up that they're all going to do the right thing. But parents, families, we've got to trust them. We've got to trust them. We do our part in education and teaching and training and nurturing, but the day comes when we let go. And here's Mary letting go. Here is Mary letting go. But I'll tell you what, Jesus never ever lost his love for his mother. Because if you come to John 19, something beautiful happens. Something beautiful, amazing happens. You know, I'm, I'm privileged. I have six brothers and sisters. I live in Australia. They all live in New Zealand. And I know that my mother is well cared for. Because they all have the same love for my mother that I have. 
And so I know that they are there looking after her. And, and, and kids, you know what? That's why you were born. Because the day's going to come when you're going to have to look after the old people. Okay? Old people are beautiful. You know, they're beautiful, lovely people. But look what Jesus does. Look, he, he never loses his love for his mother. And in John 19, verse 25, he says, Now there stood by the cross Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, by his by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to be his own. Ah, oh, what a beautiful passage in Scripture. At that last moment, when Jesus is carrying the weight of the world upon himself, who does he think of? He thinks of the mother. He thinks of the one that cradled him. He thinks of the one that made that difficult journey to Egypt when he was but a baby. And, yeah, Jesus loved her for that. For doing what needed to be done, Jesus loved her. Come just briefly to Ephesians 6 and we'll wrap it up. Ephesians chapter 6. As you step through the book of Ephesians, God is helping us to enter into a relationship. First, he wants us to enter into a relationship with him, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, a relationship with the church family, the family of God. That's uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 5, he wants us to enter into a relationship with somebody of the other sex, he wants us to find a life partner. He wants us to find a spouse. And so through Ephesians chapter 5, you've got the counsel to husband and wives. And then when he comes to chapter 6, he embraces the family. He said, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And then he goes on and he quotes the commandments, honor the father and the mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long. But you know what? It doesn't finish there. This little passage goes on and says, And fathers, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Men, you've got an important part to play in society. And the beautiful part about Christmas will live on if men... As men, following the counsel of God, you've played a vital part in the upbringing of your children, in the upbringing and the nurturing of your family. Yes, I believe family is the next best thing to Christ and to Christmas. It's what we have, it's, it, it's God ordained, it's God created, it's God put together. Right from the Garden of Eden, it's been God's intention that we would be family. Now, I just want to say that I know there's, there's people here today where their relationship is not what it was sometime past. People have separated, people have become divorced. Please, don't be offended by anything that I have said today because if your family is broken in any way, we become your family. That's what the church is about. The church becomes that, that family to help you in those situations. And so may, may God bless you all. I don't want anyone feeling here today, leaving here, feeling that, that because their family is not complete the way it was, that you need to feel bad. Stuff happens in life, but it's how you find your way from that moment forward that makes the difference. We, we, we struggle to change the past, 
but we are, with God's help, in control of the future. Mary and Joseph, Amram and Jochebed, had the responsibility of preparing the future for Moses and Jesus. May God bless us all together as we work together to be that family of God. May God bless you all. Oh, loving Father, we thank you that we're not just surrounded by angels and by your spirit, but we're surrounded by flesh and blood. Flesh and blood that has been encouraged by you to love one another. And I just thank you that that's the family that we are, that we are here for one another, and that as parents, we thank you and accept the responsibility that you have given us to raise our children and our grandchildren. And I just pray that you will bless us as we do that. I pray that we will embrace the principles of Amram and Jochebed, Mary and Joseph, as we together grow family. Bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen.